So like I said before, and anybody who didn't, who's straggling in, um, these guys did a five minute talk on their work, and now Jen and I are going to ask them a couple questions to go a little bit deeper, and then after that we'll go into audience questions, so we'll get your turn too. Um, sure. So my first question is for Maggie. Um, you commented that comics are a good way to be objective about yourself. Um, why do you think that's been true for you? Um, well, I think like when I try to write about myself or even just think about myself, I find it very easy to be self-deceiving, like to imagine that I'm a lot more complicated and like just to, to not see myself clearly at all. And there's something about drawing yourself and literally seeing yourself at arm's length that just for me has brought this astounding level of clarity about myself. and. I think everyone should try it, like, you don't have to go to art school, you don't have to think of yourself as an artist. I really think it's an incredible therapeutic tool to draw yourself and see yourself that way. I guess it's just getting distance and being able to zoom out of the quagmire of your brain. I have a question for you. Um, so when I think about you and your work, um, which seems to have so much in common, I think about open space. Um, you've talked about how zines open up private worlds, and you've also commented, even like on a video I saw, uh, about gender pronouns and how depending on which one you use, they can open up different spaces of understanding like what that means. Um, I've noticed that you don't use panel boxes in your yeah, comics. Like the little boxes. Yeah, and I also find that the, your comics seem so open and fluid and I've been drawn to them for that reason, but I wonder if like some of the things that you talk about in terms of openness, if that translates to like technique? Or... Mm -hmm. So deep. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> These questions are so researched. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I, it's funny because um, it's not intentional in the way that I'm like, ah yes, boxes are the man, they restrict me, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like, that was never like, yeah, thought process, um, more like my struggle to draw straight lines, um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think that like, um, I don't know, it's, I, you know, I think maybe as a person I just like ideas to have like a fluid open quality, because that's just, you know, life in the world, and um, yeah, I'm not sure there's like a, you know, a specific reason, but I like the idea that things can be interpreted and, you know, when I'm doing, like, history comics, I like the idea that, little, like, little characters can, like, kind of jump off the page at you, you know, and mm -hmm. a little inky splendor and just, like, grab your hand and, mm -hmm. like, oh, here, hey, what's up? So, I don't know, that's my thought. Is that deep enough? No, or totally. <laughs> totally. <laughs> responsibility to your history and those your comics are representing? Um, that's interesting because I think something that I, I want to be truthful with myself and I want to be honest with myself. I also don't want to censor myself so it's, it's kind of like one of those things where now I've gone into that black hole of accepting family on Facebook, which is such a bad idea. <laughs> so then now it's like sometimes when I post something, I'm like, shit, like Aunt Mary in Kansas City is going to see this. And then we have to have discussions. So my stories a lot of time have to do, you know, they're all my stories and how I perceive things, but they do involve other people. So I think I, something that I try to keep for myself is I, I want to keep honest and I don't want to censor myself. But if I care about the person, I also want to get their permission to put them in the story. So, like, obviously I didn't get my mom's permission uh, for the one I just showed about my mom catching me masturbating. But that's fine. She's not going to read it. But, you know, if it's, if it's like a friend, I'm definitely going to kind of ask permission. I think that's important to me. So, Also, you know, I feel like as the years go by, my memory gets a little worse. And also, I kind of like my stories when they're a little exaggerated. So... The truth is a little fuzzy sometimes, so which I think is fine. Can I actually answer that question too? Mm -hmm. Just as I have such a different answer, like for Honor Girl, I didn't ask anyone's permission. 
I haven't asked anyone's permission. I think if I felt responsible for how I depict other people, I would just be crippled by that and I would never be able to work. And so I have, I take this very sociopathic view where I'm just like, I gotta tell my truth and like everybody else can burn. And seriously, that's how I do it. And I'm fully expecting to get sued one day. <laughs> I change names, that's it. Everyone in this book, they look exactly like this. They can identify themselves. Everyone in this book knows exactly who they are. The only courtesy I did was change their names. Sometimes I just change like a syllable. So, <laughs> that's amazing. You. you don't have to be as responsible. Thank as you. Maybe I won't. <laughs> have you ever gotten a no from somebody and then oh, pulled the good. comic? I haven't really asked anybody yet. Because I haven't <laughs> Well, because I haven't written I don't think I've written a story about anybody I care about. You know what I mean? Like they were like because they were like asshole asshole punk guys in high school, uh, okay. so I don't give a shit about them. I'm not gonna ask them. Yeah. Yes, but if it was like about a good friend of mine, yeah. Okay, um, this is gonna. Just, I know. I'm just gonna close this. You guys, do you know who all these people are? So their names are not something we need to refer to. I'll just close it. All right. Um, Hazel, this is gonna sound so like snotty, I think, because I'm like name dropping a feminist comic theorist, but bring it on. Nonetheless, <laughs> Hillary Chu. For those of you who know that is, she she thinks that in terms of like you know, if we're all talking about feminist comics in a loose definition, she thinks that feminist comics investigate concerns and experiences of women that are typically relegated to silence and invisibility of the private, particularly where issues of like sexism or misogyny exist. Mm -hmm. and so um, I wondered if you well, could say something about your um, interest in talking about Gladys Bentley's experience or Wendy and Lisa and um, are, are these attempts maybe to like uninvisibilize these stories? That, yeah. yeah, I mean I think it absolutely has to do with um, exposing stories that are relegated to the private and it's tough because I didn't you know I couldn't interview any of those people myself and you know I'm still relying on some primary documents that are um, you know other people's interviews or their research or whatever but um, I mean I definitely think that it's exposing it to a wider or different audience just from like pulling from all these different sources and like no one thing is like telling me the entire scope of somebody's life so it's kind of a um, <laughs> a piece together narrative um but like i mean i knew what i knew who wendy and lisa were i had no idea that there were issues of like that they were their, their authorship of prince's uh, of prince's songs or like mm -hmm. yeah how he chose to represent them um yeah i mean that's definitely like reading between the lines and like an interpolation of like prince histories and interviews with them talking about like how they felt about the whole split with the band um yeah i i feel like it's just uh tough to like invent the the spaces between things because the way i work you know it isn't like captions and like in 1989 uh, wendy and lisa did this you know it's like i don't know it's like a mm -hmm. it's like a biographical movie or something and i'm dramatizing it so mm -hmm. Um, yeah, in that way it is exposing something new, but it's also like, and gosh, I'm getting off topic, but yeah, I mean, I chose those stories for like various different reasons. Like I wanted to do Gladys because I wanted to do somebody who was like the original drag king, or at least as close as I could get. And I heard that like her cross-dressing act was like, it wouldn't have been called drag at the time, but it was really an inspiration for a lot of other people who had mm -hmm. gender-bending acts in the future. Um, and then Wendy and Lisa, of course, like, people know them from Purple Rain, and, like, every, many, many people love Prince's music and don't know how much they created, uh, they contributed creatively because he's, like, a megalomaniac and had, you know, just this strong personality who's like, everything on Sign of the Times came from me and I recorded it all myself, but mm -hmm. like really they helped him write it. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to put that in there too because uh, Gladys' story is 
Um, kind of a downer in terms of like the mm. queer aspect or her renouncing her sexuality. So I really wanted to find something that was like a couple who, like there's nothing from like the queer perspective, like Wendy and Lisa's story isn't sad. Like they come out of it like a strong couple and then they were together for years after that and then they they broke up but still they like record the soundtrack to Heroes and like the theme song for Nurse Jackie and stuff like that now. So I kind of selected that story as an emotional counterpoint mm -hmm. to Gladys Bentley's story. Oh, sure. There is structure here. Mm -hmm. um, oh, we're at Maggie. So, um, Maggie, I just, there was something, there's a quote that you said that I loved, and maybe I'm just trying to connect it with Honor Girl, because that's what we're here to talk about, but you said in an interview once, and this is, this is I want to like have this tattooed on my arm <laughs> to remind myself. You don't need to be discovered. You don't need to be special. Just find where you want to be and make them accept you. And it's such a powerful revelation, um, and it's good advice for anybody, but I'm just, and I do love the book, The Honor Girl. It's so, it's so vulnerable and it's so revelatory, revelatory, and you said it was like the kind of defining moment of your, I don't know, launch into adulthood. And I just wondered if that thing that you said had any resonance with the story. Well, it's interesting because like Honor Girl is mostly a book about um, like being totally alienated because you realize that the person you are is completely at odds with the person everyone expects you or wants you to be. And when I said that, I think in my mind I was mostly referring to Rookie. Do you all know Rookie Mag, the rad um, teen magazine online? Um, <laughs> And when that um, website started, I, you know, I'm from the South, I was living in North Carolina, and I was just like, how could the world do this without me? The, the, I should be on Rookie, I should. But, and then it's sort of like, you have this choice of like, you can just complain about it, or you're, it's like, okay, I've, in, I've identified where I need to be, and then I just need to send them 3,000 emails. And I feel until, you know, they let me be a staff member, and like, I was nobody, and, I feel like there's this, in so many popular stories, there's this Cinderella thing of like the heroine or the hero being plucked from obscurity because they're just that great, like Luke Skywalker and Cinderella and crap. And really, it's just like, don't wait for anybody to find you because you will just die a blip on this planet. Just like find what you want and send 3,000 emails. <laughs> Because I was totally nobody, and arguably still am nobody, but I have like a clear path, and I'm still sending, I'm on like email 2,581, <laughs> so I'm working on it. <laughs> Elvis. Um, I recently heard AK Summers talk about comic and zine culture, and how they felt zine communities opened a door to a different queer community. Can you talk about your perspective regarding this as a zinester working with comics? Aha. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> yes, I can. Uh, yeah, I think zines are a great gateway drug to <laughs> for queers to comics. <laughs> no, but I think um, you know, I I guess I self-identify a little bit more um, as someone who's part of the zine community. Um, you know, less than like the comics world, and although like there's lots of indie comics, like little pockets of different things going on. Um, I just feel like zines have kind of this like, you know, total openness and freedom and like a real sense of promoting like whatever it is that you came up with as long as it has some kind of connection to you. Like if there's, you know, just if you have like a really heartfelt, you know, zine about like, I don't know, your plant that died or whatever, <laughs> and it's like smeared with your tears and like it looks kind of, you know, visually bad, like, you know, uh, that is a great zine, like that mm -hmm. is awesome. Um, I've seen people like hand write literally every copy of their zine and mm -hmm. try to distribute that. Like, I mean, just, you know, these kind of really outside the box type of stuff. Um, and I think, you know, talking about like queer content, which also is sort of outside the box, um, I think it just finds kind of a more welcoming home because it's exploring all these different kind of things that if you try to send stuff about, you know, like, you know, someone, a character using gender neutral pronouns or whatever, like something like that to a mainstream publisher, they might just be totally boggled by your entire concept just 
from even out the gate, and that's just about the pronouns. Of, you know, that's not even the interesting content that you're going to talk about. So I think, yeah, there's a lot of like translation issues um, in you know, kind of the mainstream kind of world, and even uh, even in indie comics, I find there's a lot of like um, not the kind of excitement that I find in zine culture for like really cool content that actually you care about. So that is my love letter to zines. <laughs> <laughs> Emily. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a question before, but you basically covered it in your presentation, so I'm just going to... Can I follow up on this, actually? Can yeah, I, can yeah, I yeah. say something about Of course. Yeah. So um, I, I think that's a great question, too. I started reading zines when I was in high school. Um, and I, I started reading zines when I was in high school, and I um, created a zine in high school, but then never did anything with it, because I think I was just too nervous that it wasn't cool. Um, and I, I think that I didn't really read high, I didn't really read comics in high school um, because they seem to be dominated uh, mostly by stuff that I wasn't interested in. Um, I didn't, like at my local shop in the Midwest, there wasn't like a queer themed comic. So whereas zines, um, I could kind of find those at like this like punk store in, you know, in Minneapolis. So I think that, uh, you know, I, I found that zines were maybe harder to get because I couldn't get them in the in the suburbs or in the country. But yet when I found the zines, there was more content that I, I could really relate with. Um, I also think that I have never really considered myself an artist because when I think of artist, I just like have that stereotypical thought of like being able to draw, which is <laughs> it's not true, but, and Jan always reminds me of that too. But like, I think that too, I just was intimidated by comics because the artwork was always really great. And I felt like I didn't really belong in that world. But um, when I was in college, I don't know if people remember, like, uh, Colleen Coover. She did, like, Small Favors, uh, which was, like, this really amazing, uh, like, queer porn comic. And Alison Bechdahl, Dykes to Watch Out For, was, like, on the wall. And, um, and uh, oh, my gosh, who did we just see? Ariel, oh, Ariel Schrag, if anybody knows Ariel Schrag. So, like, those were the comics that, that I found in college, and I was, like, whoa, okay, I, these changed my life. So I started relating more to comics in that way. But, uh, but I, I agree, like I love that zines, zines are, yeah, I, I do feel like there's an enthusiasm and like an excitement around zines as well, so. Yeah, so anyway, I just cool. wanted to comment on the zines. Yeah, awesome. that's a good energy. <laughs> well, my question, that wasn't that good anyway. <laughs> cool. <laughs> it was, it was, it was. Something about the fact that, like, um, so there's 14 episodes of Heartland Comics at this point, and they, they go back and forth between Jan's story and um, and then Roxy's story, or Emily's story, and and it got me thinking they're all kind of memory-based, and some of them take place when you guys are younger, when you're your current age, when in the city that you live in, and the cities that you used to live in, and so there's kind of this fragmentation where it just kind of goes like, you alternate episodes one and the other, and there, it does, there might be a more bigger structure than what I see, but I kind of see it as just like, kind of little episodes here and there. So there's something fragmentary about the way that memory functions too. So I feel like it, yes. it, it makes perfect sense as a like story structure, but I wondered if there's like, I mean, you kind of touched on it in your presentation, but like, is there some place where you might say where the wholeness resides and like mm -hmm. how it comes together? Cause it's, you know, they're two different people and you, you don't make any like direct attempt to like weave them, but yeah. you don't really. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that that's a good point. I think it definitely has to do with memory. I know, I think uh, Jan and I come up with stories that at the moment we're excited about. Um, and I know my memory is bad, so a story will come to me. Like, we were just talking in the back room, and I remembered a story, and I was like, yeah, that's going to be my next. That's going to be my next episode. So I think I just get excited. So that's definitely, like, my memory and things not tying together. But I also kind of like to weave, like, back in the day, kind of woven to what's going on at the present. And I think the wholeness comes from just Jan and my, our relationship. So like our relationship is always evolving. And so are our comics, like they're always changing and our stories are always changing. Our stories are always evolving. Our friendship is changing. Our friendship is evolving, but we're still always together. So, oh, tears. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I guess that could be the wholeness. Uh -huh. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Um, in Shame Male Bikini, you create a vehicle that allows comics to dig into the world of gaming and sexism. What connections do you see between gaming and comics, or gaming and comic artists? Okay, so the, I think the impetus for me doing Chainmail Bikini 
was that um, I was reading, I was already reading a lot of comics where people like explored parts of growing up or just their personal lives through um, through the vehicle of like what games they were playing or how they were playing those games. And when I say gaming in Chainmail Bikini, um, it's, I tried to restrict it to things that people would apply the word gamer to, and I think the commonality between those types of games as opposed to like checkers or football is the element of um, having a fantasy world that in some way you dive into. So, you know, people have the presumption that like, that because it's in a game, it's not real, but you know, of course people are like really experiencing these things. So yeah, there's quite a few stories in Chainmail Bikini about people like exploring their, and I mean women for the most part, women and uh, non-binary people exploring like their sexuality or gender through games because it sort of uh, creates that um, safe playground to explore in. So I just felt like that was like a fertile sort of area that just um, made a lot of stories that people could relate with. And you know, then of course they're both like quote-unquote nerd communities that are sort of on their own separate tracks but also have like a history of being very male dominated and like yeah that's a boy's thing or a man's thing and like yeah you can kind of like you can be in it like as long as you don't try to change it or like change it from being male at all. So, I mean, I think in that way, comics and games are sort of a natural fit. And yeah, a lot of the comics were sort of just trying to refute the whole idea of like a fake geek girl, which seems very absurd to me, but just people talking like, I've been here, I grew up with this, like this really, this is what it means to me. And it's not like some, I don't know, wheat pasted on like facade of being a gamer. Like people have really meaningful connections to these things. And you know, I think it just makes for um, a lot of interesting stories that hopefully will be of interest even to people who don't play those specific games or maybe they don't play any games. So that's the connection. I can say as someone who doesn't play games, it was really interesting to me to read it. Hey, you heard it here. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess we have like kind of general questions. Yeah. Couple general questions for the group, and just jump in however you want to answer them. And this is this is a doozy, so I don't expect anyone to have an answer, but maybe we can just talk it out. Um, how 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 would you guys define feminist comics? And you can answer it by saying whether or not you feel like you make feminist comics, or if you feel like that's not a name you necessarily need. Or um, anyone want to take a shot at that? <laughs> okay, sure. I would embrace that label. I think that all of my comics, whether they're about other people or about myself, or there's a few that are fictional stories, but not very many, are in some way or form um, about the experience of being a woman. Um, and I think that, like, it's def it's like solidly in the zone of feminist comics to. Um, do any stories with the focus of like breaking down gender roles or gender stereotypes, which, you know, kind of is a natural fit with like women musicians and of course also queer women because that like goes against a certain vision of what women are supposed to be. Um, you know, and then my own comics talk about how I do and don't fit with a vision of what women are supposed to be, but. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel like any, especially like autobiographical stuff by women that's like, here's what it's like to be me, now you have to empathize with it, and like, you know, maybe it's empowering other women who are reading it, who are like, hey, that's, you know, I, I, I relate to that, and that's not otherwise being put on the page, or, you know, maybe it's, 
like people who are not women are reading it and are you know I think comics have like a great power for empathy so I guess like I'm having trouble thinking of an exception to this I'm pretty sure that comics that make you empathize with a woman's experience in the world are feminist. But if anyone has mm -hmm. like a counterpoint to that, I'd be eager to hear that too. That sounds great. No, I just yeah. get a sign. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, can I, uh, <laughs> yeah. can I trouble, I mean, what if, okay, what if it's like an autobio comic about someone who's really anti-choice and like hates abortion, so they're politically not considered maybe feminist, mainstream, you know, but they are telling their personal story. I don't know. See, I, I just feel like there's Oh, a God, that's, that, that's interesting. That Trying does confound the labels <laughs> of feminist versus not, because it's like, I mean, that's sort of like, can you really be feminist if you're like holding back other women in some way? I mean, you could say like, can a person be feminist just as themselves if they're anti-choice, and I would say that they, you know, couldn't be because it has, like, such a manifestly negative impact on other women, so... Mm -hmm. I, I call, I call not feminist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not hypothetical example. Just trying to... Yeah. But, yeah, um, people, I don't know, people express their opinions, and then it is like, is the opinion feminist, even if it's coming from a woman? Uh -huh. I, I would venture just to be devil's advocate that you could say feminist um, just to say that like basically any story about a woman to have the audacity to say this is a story about a woman and so therefore it is important is still even and even if it's a story about like a woman who has been unconsciously weaponized against other women but <laughs> but the authorial perspective is from like unconsciously weaponized women. So I mean, do you have to be like so if it's about a chick, I'm gonna read it, and I think I'm gonna find some degree of empowerment. Okay, there. what if it's by a man though, and it's like one of those Xenoscope like, like I don't know, Little Red Riding Hood, but it's sexy comics. Like I think we can vote. So we've defined the polar ends, and there's some there's some stuff in the middle that we still have to work out. But that's a good question. It's yeah. <laughs> a really good question. Yeah. Um. Can I ask? Oh, that's yeah. an obvious question. Audience jumped in. I mean, I think your point of like the lack of feminist bookstores and how that has declined um, in the last. I think this debate is interesting, and I'm just really curious how you all would define feminism. <laughs> you know, like, I think that in itself make it a bigger is yeah. a range, and I'm just curious what, what each of you might call that. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind. I know that's also a really tough question. Yeah, can I? Go right ahead. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, I started. <laughs> I started thinking about these things because of the feminist bookstore zine. Because I was like, wow, like what is a feminist space? And I was interviewing, you know, people to do kind of like an oral history of blue stockings and who had volunteered there for years and hopefully given some thought to the stuff. But when I would ask them, oh, is blue stockings like a feminist bookstore? They'd be like, oh, of course, yes, definitely it is. And I'm not. And of course, I also believe that blue stockings is a feminist bookstore, but. It doesn't really, it's not classically like aligned with the feminist, it's not only that, you know, it's like, it's feminist, but um, there's so many different levels of like how it could be, you know, or not be, like is the space empowering the workers who are there, like how do all the things interrelate, so I felt like people said it was almost default, because I had nothing to compare it to, and that was a problem for me, because I was like, oh no, like if we only have one bookstore that is kind of feminist aligned, <laughs> That's where it ends, you know, like, because we're like, oh, well, that is feminism. I saw it. It had, like, a sticker on it. Done. <laughs> <laughs> this question doesn't exist. So I think the question in itself is really great. And I guess, um, I don't know, I don't have a simple definition of feminism. So I'm curious what other people say to that first. <laughs> I think for me, I think that when I think about feminism, I think that, um, it's about having conversations. It's about challenging status quo. It's about looking through the lens of uh, always checking about you know race, class, gender, sexual orientation. So having that conversation, 
thinking about things critically and examining those things. I know that, you know, when I discovered feminism in high school, that started to change my life because I started to think about my privilege, I started to think about my friends, I started to think about the world, and I think that, uh, to me, that's what feminism is. Um, out of, outside of the gender aspect, is it just about challenging and looking at things through that lens? Yeah, I think for me, it's I recently learned that expression like to be woke. Has everyone heard this? No. Part? It's like I don't know. I heard someone on the internet, and they were like, Bet, "Since when is Bette Midler so woke?" And it was because like she made some comment about the Oscars so white. And anyway, like it's it's really about like just like the level of awareness that you have achieved and. Like for me, I, I grew up with a ton of internalized misogyny that I'm still dealing with. And that is such a burden, like being unconsciously trained to hate yourself for being a woman and to disdain other women. And I'm so, so sick of feminist dudes who treat their girlfriends like shit. I cannot deal with those guys anymore. And so I just, for me it's like, it's really not about the word, it's just about like whether you've leveled up in your interior life about like how you see women and your relationship <laughs> to them. So I'm still defining it, I'm still working yeah. it out myself. Okay, so I think <laughs> feminism is about <laughs> uplifting people in whatever way who are oppressed by the patriarchy and by their gender. Um, and that's, like, I feel like that's a pretty broad, encompassing definition of feminism, and, like, that obviously doesn't get at all, you know, all the different axes along which people can be oppressed, but, I mean, I think that the... I don't know, like, everybody should be, like, trying to be conscious of like looking at things through all these different <coughs> lenses all the time but I think feminism is like specifically the name for the one where you like look at gender depression like I don't I don't know it's like you can't be an everything activist or maybe you can but it is <laughs> sort of a I don't know yeah it's it's a specialization and like I can definitely see why people would feel, you know, alienated by feminism if it's like, okay, you're challenging misogyny, but you're leaving other kinds of oppression unchallenged, or even you're, you know, perpetuating them, like, history of the feminist movement, or, like, women trying to get the right to vote by, like, being racist. Um, so, yeah, it's, I don't know, I... I don't want to say that feminism is like being aware of everything because people say they're feminist and they're not or yeah just I, such a mind fuck right <laughs> I know like how do you be like feminist but then also like classist and racist at the same time and is it still really feminist and yeah you know, I just, I feel like saying, like, oh, those people aren't actually, it's not feminist because they have all these other problems is just, like, you know, I don't know, you have to look at it within feminism. So that's my, that's my theory of what it is, is a lens to look at gender depression. And thank you for mentioning the patriarchy because that is, that's key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's key. Yeah. We gotta get heteronormative police state in, the, in, in here too. <laughs> nice. Um, can I ask a question relating to that? Only if you feel like sharing. When do you guys feel like you were woke? I don't think I'm using the word right. No, I'm like, it's <laughs> And you feel old. What the kids are saying these days? Like, as to what if issue, like, all issues? Like, when do you feel like you were politicized in terms of feminism? Uh, or you felt like, um, maybe you were always politicized. But, um, I do you have I, I have an answer. I, so, I'm about to say something. One of those girls, the way that girls are trained to say one of those girls in a derisive way towards other women. So I was one of those girls who had all male friends. My friends are always dudes. And I had this unconscious thing in my mind that like I was the exceptional female who could be one of the guys because I had been chosen and all other girls were not worthy. And like that messed with me for years, this 
wanting to be male, wanting to be friends with only boys to show my strength. It, I, when I realized that, that was the moment where I realized boys have trained me to think that I'm better than other girls so that they can use me to oppress other girls. And it's so <laughs> twisted and I just, it was a devastating moment and it really threw a lot in perspective and, and that, that was the moment for me when I became woke. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to uh, confess their woke stories? <laughs> 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 woke stories. <laughs> <laughs> I think really woke. Is it W O K? It's W O K. Like awaken. Like yeah. you become woke. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think for me, like body body issues were always a thing. So, um, so you know, I was always chubby, and I was never happy about that. And I just went through many, many years of having a lot of self-esteem issues, a lot of body issues, and not being okay with being fat. And I think that uh, that really, uh, yeah, and just bullying and junior high and, and those kind of things, I think. And then in high school, um, same thing with Maggie. Like, I hung out with, like, you know, just this group of guys, and I, I thought that, you know, yeah, that I was really cool because they chose me, but I never got to really say my opinion, and if I did, they were like, that's gay, you know, or <laughs> dumb. So I think that those things really led up to me, and then and then when I, yeah, when I went to college, I was like, I gotta get out of the Midwest. I gotta get out of the Midwest. Like, I'm going to New York. I'm going to Syracuse, New York. I even, like, know where I'm going. I'm going to New York. <laughs> well, I thought that was New York City, so... <laughs> So I went to Syracuse, where I thought it was New York City, and it is not, but um, <laughs> it was out of the Midwest, so, and I was like away from my family, and I could really start to think about some things on my own, and then that's kind of when I really started to accept my body and my self-image, and I, I consider myself a fat activist, and I think that, um, yeah, that's when I really started just to think about a lot of stuff, uh, and really started to consider myself a feminist and say that I'm a feminist, and I wanted to find like-minded circles, so... Um, you, you first. Okay. <laughs> um, I guess I would just say, I think it's like, for me, like a lifelong process, you know, like, uh, you know, learning about the world or whatever, but, um, yeah, I think with feminism specifically, since we're on that topic, like, um, I mean, my mom was a feminist, but, you know, as a kid, I was like, girls are stupid, I don't want to mm -hmm. view on, they're weak, they're pathetic, yeah. you know, so I think the gender stuff can really, you know, and she was like, what is this so weird, like, how did I raise this child, you know, and, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> I just think that, like, gender role, you know, there's so many other levels that um, get involved with this stuff, so I think for me it's like, um, I don't know, I volunteer at the Lesbian History Archives, and I really love like being connected to a place that, like, we are not the first four people in this world to think of this stuff, for sure. It's always, no, but it's been tried so many times that, like, it's kind of funny that every time you have a new generation of people who are like, this is amazing, we're under a patriarchy. <laughs> 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 and that's so cool, and I love that. But I'm also like, oh, God. Like, yeah, when will it end? Yeah, when will it end? Yeah, like, it's so Jesus. complex. So, I don't know. I just like seeing what other people have thought about the same topics in life, because many, many generations of people have, you know, contributed to getting us where we are tonight. Here, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay, I'm gonna kind of echo what everyone else on the panel has said about like having a period of being like one of the guys like super proud to be like tomboy, although the nerdy version of that where I've like played D and D and magic and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um and yeah, I feel like the feminism thing was kind of from day one because my mom's like a super second wave feminist, like one of the first, like, women computer programmers, never shaved her legs in her life, you know, but, but, like, very, I don't know, very second wave about it, but always, like, encouraged me not to, like, focus on my appearance or anything like that, um, but, yeah, I think I did, I don't know, I started to just, like, embrace women and femininity more in general when I got to college, and I was like, oh, all these women are amazing and all the men are like stuck in in boyhood and I don't really want to hang out with any of them um so that's kind of when it flipped from like 
being more invested in like being a tomboy to being like I can just be around mostly women all the time and like the few other people who can keep up and that's okay. Um, but yeah, become, being like woke in other regards, like especially in regards to like, I don't, like race or becoming aware of like the enduring like racism in America, that was like more of a process because I grew up in Portland, Oregon, which is like super white and it's like liberal, but I don't know, just like a lot of white people who like to think of themselves as liberal. Um, and I, I, yeah, that's, that's, that's been a whole, it's been a whole thing like realize, and that's definitely, definitely still going on, like realizing complicity and white supremacy and trying to work on my shit and trying to just, ah. Uh, it's, yeah, that's, I mean, that's a really bad matrix to see, but, you know, obviously it's one that, like, people of color are, like, always aware of, so, you know, I should get on that. So that's, that's the history of my, of my woke -itude. It's a work in progress. <laughs> oh, if I could just add one thing, like, also I think the moment I realized that men put women down, because they're fucking scared, I, that was like, like, they are so scared of powerful women. It's not that we don't deserve power, it's that they are scared. And that moment was so intense for me. And I still... When was that? That Oh, that wasn't that long ago. This was like two <laughs> years ago. I realized that when dudes treat me like garbage, it's because they're scared. On that note... <laughs> <laughs> Can we give them a huge applause? But yeah, I think like just maybe getting them into contact with stuff they actually connect to on a personal level because zines do kind of skew younger like in terms of the creators like, you know, they might find that someone in their school is actually making zines secretly and like doesn't, you know, <laughs> know if anyone will think they're cool like, you know, there's always secret zinesters out there. So that would be my, uh, yeah, just general suggestion world, but yeah. You can bring them to the archive too. Yeah. And from the zine fest in New York City. I was going to ask a kind of adjacent question, which is um, if you were going to recommend like one or two comics or zines, like you're not picking favorites, you're not making a hierarchy, you're just saying like one or two comics or zines I'm really into or would recommend people check out, what would you say? <coughs> Lumberjanes. I've been reading Lumberjanes lately. It is so cute. It's like a young adult. Um, somebody else said, I don't think um, you mentioned Ariel Schrag earlier, oh, and yes. Ariel Schrag was a revelation for me as someone from Georgia, because she writes about 
her high school experience and it, where being queer was very normal. And it's just really refreshing to read about all this yeah. super juicy gay mm -hmm. gossip that's not about like the torment of coming out. Like everybody's gay, everybody's hooking up, and it's really well done. It's it's just very refreshing. Um. A Okay, a comic that I read that I thought was awesome recently was Today is the Last Day of the Rest of Your Life by Uli Lust. It's like her um, memoir comic looking back on, um, I think she was, I think she's from Berlin, and it's like this big old tome about like this road trip that she took that went to Italy, like with her punk friend, and it was, yeah, it's like a very, uh, it's, Whatever. It just inspires you to, like, really just, like, wring all the juices out of life and has, like, incredible, like, insights on being a woman in at the time and in different European countries. And, yeah, it's just, like, a really fucking exciting story that's, like, wow, I wish that... I hope I would have had the ovaries to do that, maybe, if I was in that situation, but also, like, oh, no, what are you doing? It's so dangerous. So it's, like, a really... As far as memoir stuff goes, it's pretty, like, edge of your seat. Anyone else? I triple second that. Cool. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> yep. yep. Um, question for Elvis uh, about the remaining women's bookstores, uh, the role of fanzines and women's women's fanzines and women's comics in them, and to see how supportive they've been and how you can push to get more in. More zines and comics in those bookstores. Yes. Um, okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess I'll say like I mean. Mm, not every one of them has like totally intersectional magic happy politics, so, <laughs> so I don't know if they're like, you know, a lot of, some of them are like very old school and I don't know if they carry zines at all, but um, you know, places like Blue Stockings and in other words in Portland I think does, and um, there's the one in Chicago that's really these. Awesome. Yeah, uh, and also for women and children, women oh, and children, women children first, which right. is so awesome, right, right. Um, which I love. But yeah, uh, <laughs> so yeah, I think like, mm, I don't know if there's any role to, of like pushing more comics and zines into those places, but also just like, I don't know, what, I'm, what I noticed doing the zine is like there's not the ecosystem of like, you know, you can go do a little book tour to like all of those want places, but it would be really expensive because they're all far away from each other, mm -hmm. you know, so I think it's hard to like, um, recreate those things. But events like this are really great and just kind of like getting the local magic going. Um, yeah, more feminist events in general. Mm -hmm. That's what Do you think it's, it's the responsibility of um, male feminist comic book artists to tell women's stories and likewise like white women to tell women of color stories, cis women to tell trans women stories, or is it better to use your clout to open up the door to artists who tell their own stories work both. I do think there's a responsibility to have diversity in your comics. For me it's been a little challenging so far because I grew up so white, white, white. My first book is about a camp, there's not a single black person at this <coughs> camp and I couldn't do anything, or not just say like black people are the only minority. There's not a single person of color at this entire camp. Same with my high school which my next book is set, but when I do fiction it's really important for me. <laughs> and it's interesting that I like, but when I do fiction, it's not just white people. <laughs> because like, and it's so sad that that's what it is. When I tell stories about my youth, like it's gonna be just white people in it because that's all there was for me. But I, I think there is a responsibility to, I, I try to acknowledge the lack of diversity in my books. I try to really highlight it and be like, I'm at this freakish camp where it's me and a hundred other white Christian girls. Like, I want to really address it head on. I think as a creator, there is a huge responsibility, if you're not going to have a diverse range of characters, to explain why and why it's important in your book or why it's meaningful in your book, but to acknowledge it. I might have an, a, an additional question to that because I think I think that there's in terms of responsibility, it's complicated. I think when you say, "Oh, there should be more diverse characters," but then, as the creator of those characters, what experience are you bringing to those? So how are you how are you able to actually depict 
a person's experience having had no experience being that person. So I mean, it, it's complicated too because then you're talking about fiction, you're talking about developing characters as an act of empathy, but then there's another, as Hazel was saying, like comics do mediate empathy a lot. So you're empathizing with characters that may or may not be uh, at their core reflective of the experience of the characters they represent. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's it's a really big issue, but I think, I don't know, I hate to another panel. <laughs> you guys can come back. <laughs> Yeah, I guess probably better um, no representation than like a stereotypical representation that like contributes a to something. One. Yeah, a damaging one, exactly. <laughs> Any, something that like contributes to anything that's like just harmful to people in in real life. But um, yeah, I think that anybody who is publishing stuff like should um, do their homework insofar as like just asking people about their experiences but like hopefully not in a like you're my black friend can you tell me this is okay kind of way mm -hmm. which is hard to mediate but yeah not like know. an objectifying way right yeah. but yeah I think there's like a responsibility to be like hey is this <coughs> do you think this is accurate or how does it read to you and just like you know, reading shit that people have already written so that you don't have to, like, get your friends to, like, educate you when that's not necessarily their job. So, I mean, I feel like it's, like, yeah, do what you can and, like, hopefully read media criticism so you at least, like, know the pitfalls that other people have fallen into and you're like, oh, no, like, oh, I was gonna, like, show my trans character in a certain way, but now I see that somebody's talking about how harmful it is, I'm not gonna do that. Um, and yeah, at, you know, that when you're publishing stuff, there's tons of opportunities to like invite other people to be on panels with you, or you know, maybe you're a publisher in your own right and you're doing an anthology. Um, and yeah, just hopefully, like, if you see a way to like, uplift somebody who has like whose whose voice is being overshadowed like try to do it um so this is an open question for Barbara who is like yes, okay. so um so I volunteer for the stockings and something that we struggle with um or always are confronting is that as a feminist space we try to be both a space for experienced knowledgeable feminists as well as a space to um, push people who are not already feminists to learn about feminism um and that leads us to make you know have to make certain decisions about the books that we carry the way that we label our sections um to make sure it's appealing to everybody and it can also invite uh, conflict into the space. For example, when people come in who are not feminists who are exploring ideas for the first time that are you know, blowing their minds and making them feel super defensive. Um, and I was wondering, when you all are creating your comics, what is your intended audience? Is it experienced feminists? Is it people who know nothing about feminism or female experience? Um, and how does that inform, if at all, the way that you do your comics? Um, if I could start, just because I feel like of the four panels, I'm probably the most ignorant. And so, like, seriously, like, I, my intersectional education came very late in life. It's still very much ongoing. I feel like I'm right in the middle of it. You can probably tell from the way I express myself. I still s say things in, that are inadvertently, like, offensive all the time. I'm still really learning the landscape of the conversation. And so my books are definitely for hardcore beginners like if you are like a little baby white supremacist like you can get my book and like we'll we'll get you started because um, I I started with like a, a real disadvantage in this circle being from a conservative white southern preppy household so I want I just want everyone to be because I know this like even this space like I'm intimidated by all of y'all and I just don't want people who have the you know, they have this little liberal person inside them, but they're too scared <laughs> of all of you <laughs> to come out. And so I just, I want everyone to, to come out. <laughs> yeah. I, would, I would say for me, um, yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I don't think I have an intended audience. I think that my, 
my stories are for anybody. I like to um, think that everybody, yeah, I don't know, has the intelligence to interpret them themselves and hopefully will ask me questions about them and clear up any misconceptions. So, yeah, I, I think my, I think ours are kind of just for everybody, um, which is, yeah, another reason why we have them on the web, too. It's pretty accessible. Anybody can read them. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, in my head when I make comics, like, I just kind of think of, I guess, my friends as, like, the intended audience, but, like, you know, fellow queers, like, I mean, doing stuff about all about queer history, and um, there's a lot of different efforts to sort of translate queer history into, like, a more, um, you know, straight-friendly audience, more family-friendly audience, and I'm a pretty family-friendly type of fellow, but, <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> pretty wholesome for comics, but um, I'm not going to, like, smoosh anything down. So I think of just queer as, as my intended audience, because it's their history. And let's not say there's one queer history, but just, like, the exploration of that belongs to the people who live it. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's my thought on that. Um, yeah, um, I've definitely thought about my audience vis-a-vis -vis age, but I never really, before this question, which is why it's great, I never really thought about, like, the intended, like, feminist level of my audience. Like, are you in 101 or 201 or what? <laughs> um, but, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I'm not in graduate seminar, so I don't think that I can, like write something that's more advanced in its feminism than I personally am, but yeah, it's, I mean, I guess my stories, when they, when they touch on feminism are pretty much like, I feel like the presumed reader of my stories is like another woman, and it's like, hey, you get it, like, you've been harassed, or you've had people try to like, over your sh overshadow your creative thing or like say that a man could do it better or um or i don't know more harassment or people ask you to like shave whatever um i'm just trying to think of, like all my comics areas where i touch on feminism so i guess i'm kind of putting it out there as like hey you can uh probably empathize with this experience or feel like a, a normal person or like hey that is messed up that that happened and then anyone else who's reading it who wants to like get on board and like try like being in my shoes or looking through my lens at how they, I view the world like awesome and I don't want it to be um too alienating but yeah, it's pretty much just, like, my perspective. I saw a question in the back. I had a comment, but I kind of forgot it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was just a second. Yeah, her. Maggie? It was, like, it was more just, like, because you said that you were brought up um, in an all-white neighborhood and you felt bad about it. I just don't understand why you felt bad about it. I get what you're saying, like, you know, um, as a person you grown and you became this person and realized what was around you. I just don't think you should feel bad about the way you were brought up. Like you can't help that part. And it's just amazing that you're coming into your stuff. I mean everyone has that moment. So Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And I think um what I was more trying to say is like I know I can't help, you know, where I came from any more than anyone can, but I do feel this sort of pain at contributing something 100% white to the world <laughs> like I just feel like there's this it, I just feel like there's an opportunity missed and you know at least it's gay like, at least I can, like often I'm like it's really really white but at least it's super duper gay and you know because I just I really do feel this want to I just I want to not I it pains me to write something that's where every single character is white I hate it I know, it is. It's not like, I'm pretty sure if I wrote a story, maybe we'll be a more mixed, so I'll make sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I know if I wrote a story, it would be like, you know, mainly kids that were all color. It would just happen. But as I got older, if I wrote a story about, like, right now, it would be like, I got you guys. I'm mixed. Yeah. That's what I feel bad about. That's all. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I really probably needed that. <laughs> I love practical questions. I know, that's great. How do you make the time to have a day job? 
Um, I can, I can go. Um, <laughs> I'm really, I'm really fortunate to be in the position that I am. Um, yeah, so I am a social worker and I worked in a nonprofit for six years in Chicago and I was fucking miserable. Um, oh God, this is on camera. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was the uh, nonprofit, what do we call it? The nonprofit industrial complex. Um, and um, my lovely partner is here, Tejas. Um, and my, uh, my, my partner knew how miserable I was. Um, and she was in grad school, so I was supporting us for a while in Chicago. And now she has um, a great job, and I fucking quit my job December 31st. Thank you. Because I was, uh, yeah, the, the depression was deep. So, um, yeah, so December 31st, I quit my job. Um, I'm a trophy wife at the moment. Um, so, but anyway, so my partner is actually supporting us right now. Thank you, babe, so much. Um, so I am very, very, very lucky that I have a partner who's supporting us just in the meantime. Um, and so um, I'm doing a couple of things that I've always, always wanted to do, and this is dedicate some more time to just something that I really enjoy doing, this really fun comic with my best friend. So I am incredibly lucky, and this moment in my life is not going to last for very long, but at the moment, uh, this is what I do, which I'm very lucky, so yeah. I would say I'm in a similar situation, but I wouldn't ascribe it necessarily to luck. I would say I'm... I'm just like a hardcore hustler and like I always like I talk to teenagers a lot who want to be writers and I always tell them whatever you have to do to not have a job like slum it hang out like live with a friend live with your parents there's no shame in living with your parents live as cheaply as you can so that you don't have to get a job so that you can write all day and I just I lived with my parents for a while now I'm just mooching on a friend I do whatever I have to do to not have a job um, I do have a job. <laughs> okay, I work um, half time for a kids' comics publisher as an editor, um, which or assistant editor, but like just on the editorial side of things. And that was um, the first job that I had out of school. But like right out of the gate, like. This book is all different comics that I did while I was in art school, and I was able to get a grant to publish it. Um, it's called the Prism Comics Queer Press Grant. It's a really, it's really wonderful that they do that. So um, yeah, grant writing is a cool thing, and there's like specific stuff for comics, but there's also like you can look at things that are for visual artists or for writers and they'll probably eat it up that you're doing comics so I mean that was a really great investment because that allowed me to just like get a ton of comics printed that I could then sell online and at conventions and stuff um, and uh, also Chainmail Bikini the, um, the anthology that I did that was a Kickstarter and um, that was like a lot, it, it was more successful than I thought it would be, so that also allowed me to like get a bunch of comics printed that then I can sell like through a distributor, online, at conventions, which I do a lot of, um, and yeah. So, but, and I do occasionally get paid just to draw something, like, I mean, I hope that'll start happening more, but like I did a comic to educate teens about abusive relationships, and that was funded by a grant too, but somebody else got the grant, and then they hired me to do it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's like half day job, but then also um, I self-published a lot of books, and I didn't have to like pay for the printing costs because it was either a grant or a Kickstarter, so then I can just like you know, sell those for a meager profit, um, and then just getting directly paid for art stuff, like, to draw a comic. And yeah, between those things, it you know, I've uh, cobbled together a living for now. Yeah, we have one employed cartoonist. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess I'm not really. It's very mysterious, like how people actually like go along that path and actually make money off of comics. So I have no actual answer or idea. Um, 
I, yeah, I was working like weird office jobs for like a long time and I wasn't very creative during that period because I, although I had lots of time at my job and I thought, oh, I have time, but it's hard to use that time, I think, when you're like in an office cubicle, mm, yeah. you know, with hedge fund people circulating, it's very strange. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, I kind of, I went to library school and um, I became more involved with my grandma's care and she's 102 currently, so, uh, so that's something that's really deeply part of my life wow. and I think that leaving because of those two reasons end up leaving the kind of like you know boring office job world and that really helped me kind of start my creativity more so I guess um, I don't have any big money-making scheme ideas but uh, for me like babysitting and doing stuff like that um, you know jobs that you can like actually move in this world <laughs> like not be in a pod uh, they just help you know my body connection it's all good so that's my thought. Uh, yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I also um, add to that? I'm curious about like how you distributed this stuff and how you got that out there. I think I feel like we're a, we're a nice diverse range because mine is totally trad. It's just like a book with a publisher. You know, anyone who wants this, you can probably find it in your library. Um, so I'm super trad, old school publishing. How did you? How did you access that? Um, I started with an agent, again, with the 3,000 emails. Get an agent, harass them until they sign with you, and then they deal with everything. I'm probably the most, like, old world person up here right now, like old school publishing. And that all goes through agents, and it's all in New York. So, like, if you're here, you've done step one, and you are, like, you are ahead of everybody else, like you're here. So that is a huge advantage that you have, that you live here. So get to know agents, find your favorite book, usually in the back, like in my book, you'll see, thank you, Stephen Barr, that's my agent. Find your favorite book in the back, they'll thank their agent, and then you just send them 3,000 emails. <laughs> Are the emails just like different? Like, hey Stephen, I really like your name. Oh yeah, I would. I no, Stephen. I sent Stephen emails over the course of five years. Oh wow. I would send him an, a different email like every five months, and then he would reject me. But then I'd be like, I'm sure he's forgotten me by now, and I would just send it again. Wow. I sent it again and again and again until um, he finally signed me. Wow. Okay. So just be psychotic about it. <laughs> It'll take you far. Persistence, cool. Um, <laughs> okay, so my scheme of getting comics out there is um, print some stuff up physically. Like um, mini comics are a a nice thing that you can do, especially if you like have access to a school or somewhere that has free printing or an office or even if you don't like probably you know someone who does so see if you can like print your comic for free um and then just like um zine fests are really amazing in terms of having a lower um almost always like a lower cost to table and a lower barrier for entry but then there's also like indie comics fests so that's pretty much my whole thing is just like um, going to a lot of those, and then, um, yeah, there's also, like, once you have your self-published thing, mini-comic or book with a spine or whatever, um, find, unfortunately, I mean, your question is, like, a good, hard question, because distribution really is, like, the bottleneck. And also, like, if you can find any way to, like, have Twitter followers or, like, attract people to your presence online, which is its own whole thing, then you can always, like, set up a store there or set up a Patreon and be like, pay me $5 every month and I'll send you a postcard or I'll, you know? So those are, like, more direct ways to get to people. And then there's, like, a couple comics distributors that you can go through if you're like doing an indie thing um yeah there's a guy there's one guy he lives in new jersey his name's tony shenton he's like the guy who like calls up comic stores all over the country and is like do you want to place an order so yeah you gotta talk to tony shenton talk to tony <laughs> and then he'll like set he like sends me orders and it's my responsibility to like ship them and send an invoice and stuff 
So he's really like a sales rep, not really a distributor. But then he only takes like 10%. Um, but it's like, you know, I have to try to be on top of stuff with like looking at like store and fee orders or like all these different places that stuff's coming in. Um, oh, and the last thing you can do is like, if you know somebody who like works for a bigger publisher, like, you know, maybe even like Fantagraphics, but like a comics publisher, you buddy up to them and you say, do you want to sub distribute my comic? Like, here's a stack of them, like, you'll take a percentage, and then whatever the real distributor who has the catalog will take a percentage. But that's a way to, like, get your stuff into, like, a big book distribution catalog that stores order from, is you, like, buddy up to a bigger publisher who already has that network. Yeah, just suck up to everybody. <laughs> Any of you use Gum Road, right? Um, oh yeah, Gumroad is a cool ass thing for just if you have a PDF that you want to sell and you can have like, oh it's five dollars or it's five dollars plus, like if you want to have it be more and always have the plus because somebody is always <laughs> going to like think it's worth more than you think it's worth. So that's another thing where like if you find the way to get people to look at your shit online which has to do with like meeting people in person and then maybe they'll look at it online or I don't know. I don't have that many Twitter followers. So like I'm you could read a whole book about that, but like yeah, once you get the eyeballs on it, you can have your online store or you can just sell PDFs and then you don't have to send anything out. I would say when it comes to comics and zines, Tumblr is Tumblr to me seems like where most people are at. Um, yeah. And right now, I mean, for Jan and I, Heartland Comic is just online, but we do hope to um, do something a little bit different. Um, so, so. Um, I guess I would just add into the mix, uh, zine libraries, they're so great. Um, mm. <laughs> you can take a stat, you can mail your zines and comics to zine libraries, and then you have like such a random group of people that's going to see that, like students who stumbled into the public library in like Cincinnati or whatever, um, might end up seeing, you know, your stuff, and it's pretty cool, so it's kind of like a, yeah, alternate world. Sure. Oh, and you can just walk into bookstores and just be like, hey, do you want to consign these or do you just want to buy them? So, like, if you know bookstores that are selling zines or comics or whatever, you can be Tony Shenton. You can go and be Tony. Yes. Okay. Um, so, I guess I would also want to say a big thank you to Emily, who did a lot of work organizing this event. So, if we could give her a little. Then there's the bathroom down the hall, beers around the corner, and I think if we could just, um, uh, if you are sitting on a folding chair, if you can fold it up and maybe like put it in the hallway, that would be super big help because we're all volunteers and we're just going to get them into another room. And then you can see the exhibition hang out. And also these guys have some comics for sale in the other room. Um, I think we're cash only, but um, go down the hall and have a look. And thank you guys so much. Thank you.